This next item is not an action item. You'll not find materials in your binder. This is Court Innovations Grant Program, the Superior Court of San Francisco, their Veterans Justice Court Project. I welcome all to have a seat, and, and I'm sure Judge Rubin will introduce his panel. Well, then, while they're taking their seats, good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen, again. Uh, Chief Justice, ladies and gentlemen of the council, anyone listening. Uh, as we were talking a little bit earlier about the Judicial Branch Budget Committee, we have several charges, and one of them is the Innovations Grant. You'll recall, for those of you who weren't there, for those of you who were, in the 16-17 budget year, with the leadership of the Chief and Martin, and uh, we worked with our sister branches, and we were given a $25 million for an Innovations Grant project. The Innovations Grant was cut into three segments. One of the segments was the Collaborative Courts segment. It was the largest segment. Um, and what we've been trying to do at each meeting now that the projects are about, uh, about halfway through their, their life cycle in terms of development was to start presenting each meeting a grant so that you can see kind of what the money has been doing, what has been going on in the branch. You'll recall that there was a tremendous response to the Innovations Grant program. The, the branch responded with many, many, many ideas and many projects. There's a lot of vitality out there. We're trying to showcase for you some of what's out there. This is just a sampling of what's out there. So today, we're pleased to hear from representatives from the San Francisco Veterans Court, the San Francisco Superior Court's Veterans Court. The court will discuss with us this enhanced Veterans Justice Court project. What they've done is expand their evidence-based practices or trauma-informed treatment to participants in conjunction with support of a clinical case manager to provide care to participants who are not eligible for a full VA, VA health benefit package. The main project or the main goal of this project is to increase the graduation rate of Veteran Justice Court clients and to, to reduce recidivism among the participants. So let me introduce today's panel, uh, the, today's folks to talk about the program with you. We have Judge Michael Beggert from the Veterans Justice Court in San Francisco Court. We have Ms. Allison West, the Veterans Justice Court Coordinator. And we have also, and I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Darian Evans, who's a Veteran Justice Court participant, whom we thank for his service to his country and also for what he'll be sharing with us today. So with that, let me introduce the Veterans Court folks. Thank you. Chief Justice and Counsel, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here and honored to be able to present to you the San Francisco Veterans Justice Court. Uh, your support is incredibly valuable to the work that we're doing, so thank you very much. Um, I have presided over six different collaborative courts at this point, and in the collaborative courts, uh, we encourage people to be open about their challenges. So I'm going to tell you I'm feeling a little bit challenged right now. Um, I am a little intimidated by the um, esteemed group that I'm addressing uh, and the importance of uh, your support to the work that we do. Um, I'm also... Um, conscious of the fact that in the not too distant future, uh, one of your members will be deciding whether I will remain on the Veterans Justice Court. So good morning, Judge Feng. <laughs> I was wondering where you were. <laughs> uh, and I'm also uh, a little uh, intimidated by the fact that I'm going to be sharing the stage today with Darian Evans. Uh, one of the clients of the Veterans Justice Court, and I know that everyone in this room, myself included, is more interested in what Mr. Evans has to say. So uh, I will uh, try to be brief. Um, I think it's wonderful that you get to hear from uh, Mr. Evans. Uh, I wish and invite each of you to actually observe what happens at the Veterans Justice Court as Judge Nadler has, uh, and to see uh, real people working, striving, and struggling uh, with fundamental questions uh, that you probably take for granted, questions about how do I become a responsible adult, how do I regain control of my life, um, how do I envision a future for myself, and how do I believe that I am worth something when uh, everyone in my life is telling me that I'm worth nothing. 
So um, that's the work that we try to do. That's the work that you enable us to do, and uh, I thank you uh, for that. Um, I'm going to take a brief uh, philosophical digression here. Uh, I hope you'll indulge me. We are uh, part of the criminal justice system, and I think you'd all agree these are interesting times for people doing that work. Um, this is a treatment court, and so we are always balancing and considering uh, these interests, which I will characterize as what people deserve and what people need. Uh, on the one hand, what they deserve being a backwards-looking interest um, and what they need being a forwards-looking interest. So on the one hand, uh, under what people deserve, questions like accountability and responsibility and punishment. Um, and on the other hand, what people need being healing and recovery uh, and reconciliation. So uh, in philosophical terms, we would call this the distinction between uh, deontology and utilitarianism. We won't go into that right now. Uh, in legal terms, we'd call it retribution versus rehabilitation. And uh, we can have a discussion about how best to serve uh, the various interests that we all share, uh, and whether that is a retributive model or a rehabilitative model. Um, I would contend that uh, issues including procedural cost, social cost, public safety, and fairness uh, would counsel in favor of uh, a rehabilitative model. But these are not things that are mutually exclusive. Um, sometimes people need to get what they deserve, and sometimes uh, people I would say always, people deserve to have their needs met. Uh, the advantage of working in the context of a veterans court is that I think we have broad societal consensus that veterans do deserve uh, to have their needs met as a result of serving their country and particularly under circumstances where their service has uh, resulted in um, physical or uh, emotional uh, challenges that have contributed to their contact with the criminal justice system. So uh, there's widespread support for uh, having justice uh, courts for specifically for veterans, and I'm, I'm proud and honored to be involved in uh, San Francisco's. So uh, I'll go through basically who it is uh, that we serve. Um, how it is that we attempt to help them, and uh, with what results. So eligibility. Uh, the main requirement here is that they have a case in San Francisco. Uh, they can be a resident of any county uh, as long as their case is in San Francisco. They can have any length of service in the military, uh, and they can have uh, any type of discharge, honorable, dishonorable, or other than honorable discharge. Their criminal exposure can be both a misdemeanor or a felony. Uh, and the procedural posture of their case can be pre-plea, uh, deferred entry of judgment, or um, a probation case. Uh, people who are not eligible would be um, where the district attorney's office uh, is uh, not offering anything less than a pri state prison sentence, uh, so they would not be able to participate in um, uh, any of the treatment programs. Uh, so those people would not be eligible for the Veterans Justice Court. And we do not require um, that there be an established connection between their military service and the conditions that brought them into contact with the criminal justice system. Uh, since, uh, so the way that we provide these services is um, through a licensed uh, social worker um, who is provided by the VA. That is um, for people who are eligible for VA benefits. The uh, huge benefit that the innovation grant provides us and the work that you enable us to do 
is that uh, we can serve people who are either on what's called a grant per diem or have no benefits. So these uh, clients are serviced through social worker who is um, provided through San Francisco pretrial diversion and paid for by the innovation grant. But for that innovation grant, we would not be able to serve those clients. Um, this gives us the ability to assess people for their needs both in custody and out of custody. And very significantly, when we can assess people while they're in custody, uh, we can also issue an order that allows them to be picked up by the veterans court social worker and taken directly to a residential treatment program so that uh, they are not out on the streets uh, where uh, they can encounter dangers or get into trouble. Um, and that is a critical piece that's not available to all of the um, treatment courts that we have. So it's very important that we be able to uh, take people from a safe place and directly uh, place them in a program that's going to help them. Uh, we have status reports that the court receives uh, and the justice partners receives, uh, receive that are prepared by case managers and maintained in a database. And we track that data on a court-hosted database. Um, we can serve needs through providing housing, um, DV therapy or counseling through an at-ease program. Uh, substance use treatment through outpatient programs, detox, and residential treatment. And uh, we can serve people's mental health needs, in particular PTSD and traumatic brain injury through uh, various kinds of evidence-based programs. Uh, many of these programs, the training is provided by the Innovation Grant. Uh, the innovations that we have are that uh, we have a full-time licensed clinician for participants without VA health care. We would not have that without your support. Uh, and we have training for clinicians on um, evidence-based practices, interactive journalism, journaling, uh, seeking safety, and moral recognition therapy. Uh, all of these designed to help uh, people adjust their thinking, uh, which evidence shows will contribute to uh, success and better outcomes. Uh, some of the challenges that we face are uh, the availability of substance use treatment beds. Uh, that is a challenge, uh, more so actually if you're not um, afforded VA uh, benefits, uh, but it is uh, a problem for everyone. Um, that includes detox beds, residential treatment, and dual diagnosis in particular. Uh, those are challenges and the wait times um, can be long uh, when we don't have beds available. Uh, we also uh, need uh, and are working on expanding our mentor program. It's important for these veterans to have um, someone that they can talk to that understands what they're going through. Uh, and we're trying to expand that. Uh, we need funding for recruiting and for materials to uh, train and support those mentors and to pay for outings so that they can uh, build a bond with uh, the clients. Um, we have had 400 referrals since 2013, so we're about six years old now. Uh, 50 active clients, 185 graduates, uh, 29 uh, were terminated, 21 uh, we don't count because they've been on bench warrant status for uh, greater than 60 days. 66 uh, elected to opt out and 59 were referred who were not eligible. Um, a recidivism rate for graduates is 14%. Uh, this is a number that I particularly like. Recent graduates, which means people who graduated um, October 1st, 2017 uh, forward, and current participants have a recidivism rate of 2.2%. So people who are in the program are doing well. Um, the breakdown of uh, how the benefits are divided are 57% have VA benefits, 29% have grant per diem, and 14% have none. That's significant because if you look at that, that means 
um, up and down at any given moment, you, ha you, you could have as many as 40% of the participants serviced by that social worker who's funded by the innovation grant and they would not get service if we did not have that innovation grant. Um, 63% of the participants come to us with felony charges and 37% with misdemeanors. Uh, here are the uh, demographic breakdown of the participants and the average age is uh, 49 years old. So, uh, and it's getting younger all the time. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Mr. Evans. Uh, I'm sure you're all anxious to uh, hear from him. And uh, I will say uh, he is uh, a wonderful participant in the program. He was he served in the army for uh, three years, uh, and he has been a participant in the Veterans Justice Court since uh, January of 2018. So, Mr. Evans, thank you, Your Honor. Um, good morning, Council. Uh, my name is Darian Evans. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. Um, wow. I remember um, prior to catching the case that I caught that landed me in jail. Um, when I prior, you know, prior to me becoming a, a participant in the VJC, I was completely uh, lost, for lack of better words. Um, I I was hopeless. Um, my PTSD was through the roof. I was in the worst alcoholic relapse that I had ever been in. Um, and I truly felt like I was beyond human aid at that point. Um, I was completely out of control. I would look in the mirror and not recognize myself. Um, I was full of anger, uh, hopelessness, uh, shame, guilt, violence, rage. And um, I just remember uh, I, I just feeling like, I, like I said, I was beyond human aid. And I could not stop myself. I was completely separated from the spirit that I feel that I needed the spirit of God. I was completely removed from it. Um, when I, I caught my case January 9th, 2018, uh, I remember, you know, wake after I woke up probably on the, uh, the next day in jail, I remember feeling like I was exactly where I was supposed to be. I had a sense of um of gratitude almost gratitude I had a sense of gratitude being in jail cuz I was like finally something stopped me uh from this this fast track to hell that I was on um my behavior was that of somebody who wanted to wanted to die somebody who didn't care if he got killed um I felt like I was not being the father that I knew I could be to my children. Um, I wasn't the son that, that my parents raised me to be. I wasn't the, uh, the soldier that the army raised me to be. So I definitely felt hopeless. Um, and at that moment, I felt like I got what I deserved when I, when I, when I ended up at 850 Bryant in jail, I felt like I got what I deserved. Um, so yeah, I remember being around other, the other inmates and everybody's story was, you know, how they're going to get out. And I didn't do it. It wasn't my fault. I shouldn't be here. Yada, yada, yada. If only I had made a left instead of a right. <laughs> 
I wouldn't have got caught, you know. And I was the only one sitting there saying, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And uh, to an extent, I was. Because that's where the VJC found me. And um, when I caught, when I, after catching that case, I just, I, I, I had it made up in my mind that I was going to be gone for about four to seven years, you know, um, and I was ready to take that on because I thought that that's what I deserved. And um, I was, a, I remember being uh, somebody knocking on my cell saying, you know, you, you have a visitor, a visitor in jail. Like, what? How does that work? Like, not on visiting day. <laughs> And uh, it, it was a representative from the VJC, uh, Jennifer Ferreira. Um, and she told me that the VA was going to pull me out of jail and get me into the services that I really needed. And uh, I was like, nah, y- y'all must not be, y- you must not know what I did <laughs> or what I'm accused of, excuse me. And so uh, she she said, no, uh, we can help you. And um, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I remember calling my, you know, calling my children and telling them, hey, y'all, I might be home real soon. And from that day, that day, I had hope again. I had not. I hadn't had hope in a long time. Uh, hard liquor, depression, and anxiety can erase all hope, all morals, um, just anything that you used to be. You know, alcoholism can take that from you, and it took it from me. Self-respect, even my size. I you know, some, you hear about some people who they drink and they get a beer belly. And I, no, I drank for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. No food. I was almost skin and bones. Um, but, yeah. Um, so I had hope again. I had hope again. And I've had that hope ever since. And um, th- when they pulled me out about a week, about a week later, I was as y'all can imagine, completely full of gratitude. And they pointed me in the right direction. They got me uh, the treatment that I needed. You know, I felt like I didn't, I didn't think I deserved to go to rehab again. I didn't think I deserved to, you know, just have the luxuries that we take for granted every day. But um, when I said that to my friend Allison here that I, that I didn't deserve um, that I deserve to be in jail. She said, "No, that is not what you deserve." You know, she, and um, you know after after going to detox and rehab and thing, you know, all the things that I, that I needed to do, uh, I had what AA calls a spiritual awakening as a result of doing what I'm told <laughs> and uh, the byproduct I feel of my spiritual awakening is um, inner peace. Something I have, I have not had, I, I hadn't had probably ever in my life. Um, and I can attribute that, can attribute that to the, what we call the gift of desperation. I was desperate to get well, feel better without liquor or, or pills or anything like that. And I got it. I got it. And I owe that to this program, the Veteran Justice Program. Um, as of today, I'm still sober. My relationship with my 13-year-old daughter and my almost 18-year-old son is better than it's ever been. Uh, I'm a productive member of society, and um, I've been blessed from what I've told, what I've been told, blessed with a voice that people listen to, 
And um, I try to give back. And that's what we do in AA. Uh, the best way to keep what you have is by giving it away. And that's what I do today. I help others who've been down the road that I've been down. And worse, um, older gentlemen, older women, younger folks, white, Asian, black, Mexican, all of, you know, when it comes to the spirit, you know, we're, we're all brothers and sisters. And uh, I'm glad that I was blessed with the circumstances that I went through and survived so I could be able to help others. My name is Darian Evans, and thank you. I, I did. Thank you, Chief. Um, I just wanted to, to make a couple of remarks. First of all, I am, and most all of us are, uh, great supporters of collaborative courts. But um, as a person who spent his childhood growing up in the military, and as a person who spent four years on active duty in the Air Force, uh, I am particularly impressed with the veterans' courts. And every time I hear a program like this, and a success story like Mr. Evans, I am even more impressed. And uh, Judge Beggard a few minutes ago mentioned uh, deserve what people deserve and what they need. People like Mr. Evans and all of his colleagues who are veterans, they deserve this type of attention because after all, at one point in their lives, they raised their right hand, they took an oath, which was an oath that that basically said they were willing, if necessary, to give up their life in defense of the country. And I can't think of anything that is more compelling than that. And Mr. Evans, congratulations. Best of luck. Keep it up. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah. Thank you. Judge Bacigalupo. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, Mr. Evans, I'd like to thank you for your uh, testimonial and uh, sharing with us uh, your experiences and what you've been through. And I um, would like to comment, uh, if you don't mind, that with respect to the journey you have been on, and you are attributing much of it to the opportunities that this uh, Veterans Court provided you, you would not be here, I believe, if it wasn't for your determination, for your willingness to do all the hard work which is necessary for you to achieve the accomplishments that you have. You should not underestimate what you have done. And uh, Judge, I want to commend you for running this uh, program. I would like to ask if uh, there are services available for family members uh, who are part of the circle of, uh, of uh, participants in the program so that they too can be part of the support system to help uh, integrate their uh, family members uh, back into the community. So I'm going to let uh, Ms. West answer that, but I will say this, and I think Mr. Evans will back me up on this. The best thing that can happen to that family unit is for this veteran to get better. Thank Good morning. You. Yes, um, the VA offers actually sort of extensive services, particularly for family members. Um, they have for family support, um, family therapy. It's a little more difficult for our veterans without VA health care services because the city and county, even though we are a very rich city and county, we still don't have enough services for our justice-involved citizens. And um, But one thing about the position that is funded by this grant is the person who's in it now has been working in the city for a very long time and found a lot of really great resources to support the veterans for with individual and group therapy and family reintegration services. So um, there are some, but not enough. Thank you. Judge Botke. I just wanted to echo what... You said, Paul, uh, Mr. Evans, I, ha I oversee two collaborative courts in my courtroom, and when the participants thank the court and thank the members of the team for everything they've done, I am quick to jump in and say, you know, you really have to thank yourself, because even though the team and the court provides the opportunity, it's the individual that has to provide for themselves with those resources 
So again, I think, as Paul said, um, you know, a lot of thanks goes to you, Mr. Evans, because you're the one that got it done, aside from Judge Beggard and the team providing you those opportunities. So nice work. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. I also want to join in thanking uh, you, Ms. West, for facilitating this, you, Judge Beggert, for your leadership in taking on a court and making it yours and making it available and the fact that you bring many, many skills to a court because this is not particularly traditional judging as it's been in the last several decades. So I thank you for what you bring to the community of San Francisco. And I know, Mr. Evans, we, we all speak for the fact that we wish you the very best. I think you said it best when you said, in spirit, we are all brothers and sisters. And that's really important for the courts and for us to think about going forward. And congratulations on the work you've done and the work you continue to do, and especially as you continue to mentor and reach out to folks who are on the beginning of the journey that you've accomplished thus far. So thank you again for being here and sharing such intimate information with us. We're appreciative. Thank you.